Here we go. Welcome. My name is Morgan Denton. This is the fifth session of In Search of Grading for Equity. Um, we're thrilled to see you all back after uh, a month break. I have to say, not a huge fan of July 2020. Not, not really uh, good for me, so I'm thrilled it's August. We're here. Uh, we made it this far. So um, thank you very much. I'm joined by my co-host today, Patty Forster. Hello. So, so for those of you just coming in, we've asked if you would add a number um, and before your name of the pillar that you studied. Um, and this is going to help us. We're going to have uh, breakout rooms later on, and, and we're mixing people up. So I want to make sure you're properly blended. Um, and if you didn't study any particular pillar, then don't put a number before your name. I will randomly assign you. Um, OK. And, and thank you all very much. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and I'm going to share this one. And I need to take it back to, um, sorry, it, it really helps for me to talk it out loud, right? Keep it going. You're good. Keep talking. There we go. So, I have a feeling I might have just shared the wrong screen. Um, That's okay. I will share the right screen. Here we go. This is the one I want to share. All right. Now I'll move everything else out of the way. If I can. All right. I chose uh, what I thought was a really interesting and vibrant color as a background here. Um, there. Hopefully what you all see now. We're good. It's good. All right. Good. Excellent. All right. Welcome. Um, so this is a follow up to um, the, the study that we did in June. Uh, some of you studied together in small groups, the different pillars, and some of you uh, worked independently. Um, that's great. We're going to talk just a little bit. We have a wellness check in. Um, I want to make sure that we're keeping in mind the big picture where this whole, uh, I'm calling it a grassroots movement of grading for equity fits. And then um, we will review the protocol for this meeting, the way of sharing so that we can all understand all three of the pillars. Um, first of all, got to say welcome. I'm just so glad that you're here. I, I cannot express how grateful I am that you've hung in and you're here now. So we're going to do a little bit of a, of a wellness check-in. Patty, do you want to lead us on this one? Yes. So um, I've been doing this gratitude practice for a while now. And in times like now, when we're all starting to get geared up and stressed about school and what's going to happen and who knows how it's going to change in the next month, it's really important to try to balance out that stress with positive things as well. So um, we're gonna do a little gratitude practice as our wellness check. Because gratitude releases dopamine and serotonin in your brain. So when you actually express that you are grateful for something, you're actually putting some good stuff through your brain and through your body that's gonna help balance out the negative stressors that we're all gonna be dealing with as we move forward. So, um, and, I, and I learned about this practice about 10 years ago. I watched this video called Happiness 101. Um, and it was by a guy named um, ben, Tal Ben Shahar, who was the first to teach a course on happiness at a college, and it was at Harvard, and it became the most popular course at Harvard, a course about happiness. So we really have to work on that, especially in times like right now. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do, we're going to throw you into breakout groups for just a short time, maybe about three to four minutes, and I'm going to ask you to share three things that you're grateful for. When I do it, I try to do five, but three is good too. And sometimes I have my students do this. So think of three things that you're grateful for and be very specific. So don't say, I'm grateful for my mom. Say, I'm grateful for my mom when she tells me how proud she is of me. Like, so be very specific with that piece of gratitude. So I want you to think of three things, things that you are thankful for. Will you remind me, Patty, how much time we're giving them? I'm, it, it's not going to take too long, so, so let's, let's do four minutes and um, we'll see how it goes. 
okay? Okay. Small groups so that they each get a turn to share. Hold on, I was, I was creating the later rooms. Okay. Gives people a little processing time to think of what they're grateful for to go share out in a group. Okay, there you go. All right. Folks, you just have to click on the link to go to your room. Ruth, you should have a button inviting you to uh, go to a breakout room. Hello. Hi, Ruth. Hello. Hi. My internet keeps going. I've lost you like 10 times. Wow. So you should have a, a button right now that's asking you to go to a breakout room. Hello? Sorry, Hello? I, I was problem solving and I hit Hello? the wrong button. Hi, Ruth. I'm, I've lost you like 10 times. Sorry, Hello? sorry guys, I accidentally hit the wrong button. So I'm sending you back to your rooms. Sorry. I was gonna say, I'm more grateful than that, but. Oh boy, I can tell it's going to be that kind of a day. It's okay. There you go. Everybody should be able to rejoin their room. I apologize. I'm still out here, Laura Sally. I hit the wrong button. I do. Oh, Marley. <laughs> Marley, how you doing? Hey, Laura, I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Are you? Yeah. I didn't get back to my room either. All right. <laughs> we can meet together. Hang out in the hall together. We can share yeah. gratitude right here. Ah. We're the hall. We're the hall monitors. There we go. Yeah, yeah, my like a whole bunch of people who didn't uh, end up getting back to their rooms. I had to stop clicking buttons. Like, do not touch any buttons. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Yeah. Well, there's a little pressure in the end right now. <laughs> okay, so Making it's one the rest of work to go back to your group. At the bottom of your screen, and there's a thing that says breakout rooms. You click that button, and then it shows you where you can join back. Oh, oh. Give that a try. We'll give you a couple more minutes. We'll see if this works. Daddy, you're an expert at this. I never noticed. I that. didn't know. I just discovered it. I'm not afraid to click on things. <laughs> All right. Looks like it's starting to work. People are making it back. Anybody else need help getting back into their breakout room? Yes. Bottom of your screen where you could click on chat. There's a thing that should say breakout rooms, which has four squares. Click on that. 
I should bring up a little notification that you click join breakout room. Are you stuck? <laughs> God sakes, I hit a button. Okay, so I think we're all just about back in here. I hope, sorry for the technical difficulties. Morgan and I are out of practice. With the, well, Morgan is with the Zoom because she hasn't, she's been out of commission, but uh, we'll get the hang of things. And um, I hope you're feeling a little bit better having shared some things that you're grateful for. And, and maybe, especially as we move into this, uh, getting closer and closer and we're all starting to have our little teacher dreams. Uh, that you use that as a practice to help balance things out. Okay, Morgan, we're ready to move on. Okay, we're gonna talk about um, the, the big picture. I just wanna remind us that one of the reasons we got into this uh, study of, of grading for equity and looking for these equitable practices um, is rooted in what happened in the spring with the emergency learning. Uh, lots of folks were asking for direction from DOE, and the word that came from the commissioner was, grading is a local practice, but I'm telling you, do no harm. Do no harm. Those three words are huge, and in order to do no harm, uh, I think we have to rethink many, many things. So um, that, was, that was how we began looking at uh, what we can do um, with grades differently in this context. So first of all, I, I want to emphasize this idea of equity is a huge concern for the state of Maine. And there's a whole new equity team at DOE who um, they're, they're looking at um, uh, looking very broadly across our education systems to see what we can do to improve um, equity for all students and all teachers. Um, so you need to know that there was special funding. I had like five minutes to, to do an application um, for these quarantine projects. And fortunately, uh, Patty had brought this book to my attention. I was really interested in it. It perfectly fit. So this is how we got into this. And we are now wrapping up this special quarantine project. Um, in June, of course, we, we met, we had the four sessions. In July, there was the deeper dive that was done in groups or individually, however anybody wanted to do that. And now we're, we're coming back together to jigsaw all of these different pillars and these practices, but we're also getting ready to have a discussion with the commissioner and hopefully members of her team who are looking at innovation and equity and some of the special projects coming up. 
I have to tell you that I asked for the meeting and I uh, worked with um, uh, an assistant to get this on the calendar. This was not a request that came from the commissioner. It was a request that came from me to the commissioner for you to have an audience with her and to talk about your study and why grading needs to be a, a component of these equity efforts um, from a systemic point of view. And so that's what's gonna happen next week and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So here's the protocol that we're planning to use. Patty, why don't, why don't I let you um, talk about that protocol while okay. I attend to some of these other Perfect. things? Not gonna take long. We have, we met with um, team leaders last week and they helped us do some planning ideas of how to structure today. But basically we're gonna go through different groups who will give a quick one minute summary of the pillar in case there are people in the room who didn't study all the pillars or read um, the other sections of the book. And then they'll do like a one, two minutes. These are short, they're not forever long. Uh, one, two minute, kind of practice a single spotlight or multiple spotlights that you could really like that they think would be good to use. And then to share as well the commitments from the group, like what are they really going to actually try to apply going into the fall. So that's kind of the protocol. And with these, each of these, we're also um, going to try out some different Zoom tools that you'll see um, as ways to engage the larger group, not just the people speaking. Um, and so I think that's kind of exciting and will be interesting for us to be learning about as well in case we do end up, any of us, doing hybrid learning or remote learning completely. Ready, Morgan? I think so. So, um, we're gonna launch a poll here. I didn't even know there was a poll in Zoom. This is kind of cool. Yep, we're gonna launch a poll. This was a poll that was um, created by uh, our, our Pillar One folks. So I'm gonna give you a minute to, um, to respond to that. So cool, I've never seen this before. Look at all the voters, 76% have voted. Ninety-four percent. We may get a few more. We'll give it about ten more seconds. Oh, she's got 40 seconds on there. You did the timer even. That's cool too. How did you get to that poll thing? Morgan, anyhow, where is that located? It, it's in the controls. I set this up before we even started. Mm. All right, I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. So, not surprising, very few of us believe we are entirely accurate with our grading practices in the past. We're sort of in between the mostly and somewhat categories. Um, hey, Morgan, I don't know if you could do this, but maybe you could later do a quick screen record of how to set up a poll and send that out to the group for anybody that would like to try that um, with classes later. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, I will. And actually, um, at the end, before we leave, um, I'll just show you. Okay. Um, so we've got some slides from, from someone um, uh, who gave us, I can't remember which of the first two groups. So if this is your slide deck, please step up and we'll jump in. Who's here? That's, hi, that's that's our group. Give me just one moment here to. Uh, I'm trying to make your. There we go. I can jump in too, Bree. All right, there we go. Yeah, I'm gonna try to get the little one to not whine too much <laughs> during this presentation. So I apologize if you hear her. She always wants to be right on my lap. Um, wow. All right, so uh, this is yeah, this is our presentation for pillar one, uh, which was accuracy, and our group was for the high school level. Um, and the pillar basically is that uh, grades need to accurately reflect a student's academic performance. <clears throat> if you want to advance to the next slide, you can. I don't know how much of the slides you want us to go through, so I'll kind of summarize it. These were the folks in our group. I am Brie Allard speaking. <laughs> 
And next slide shows the um, well, they're not going to show the transitions like I wanted to. That's okay. Um, so our practices within the pillar are avoiding zeros and minimum grading and the zero to four scale, weighting more recent achievement and grades based on an individual's achievement and not the groups. Um, there were four of us in our group. So each of us actually chose one of these bullet points to do our further research on. And it wasn't even like we had to really have a long conversation as we were reading through uh, Joe Feldman's book, we all actually kind of fell into those four bullet points on our own. And so it kind of worked out nicely when we decided to split up our additional research. Um, and the last one, the grades based on individuals achievement, not the groups, um, we kind of looked at collectively as a group, but I'm not gonna speak much about that today. In a way, most of us felt like that was sort of like a uh, duh, Obviously, we may, but you need to grade on the individual, not the whole group work, because we kind of know some students don't do all the work. And, you know, how do you really grade fairly that way if you're giving them a grade they didn't necessarily participate as much? So we just focused on the first four bullet points for this pillar. Um, I'll go through it quickly. You don't necessarily have to change slides because it's not going to work. I have lots of different cool transitions. I don't think they're going to happen. Um, so I, yes, because I did it as a Google slide. So if you, you can go through, but you, not everything will show up. So I can, you can just stay on this slide. That's fine. And then I will, um, um, and I'll just kind of talk briefly about all of them. So avoiding zeros essentially was that, um, well, don't give a student a zero. Um, I, I, I know that later on a group will talk about motivation, but this kind of starts that idea of motivation. Um, if you give a student a zero, they're obviously going to feel demotivated to really try to reassess or look at or look at what they need to improve on. Um, one thing that I love that Joe Feldman said in his book was that he compared it to fishing. And just because a student doesn't catch a fish doesn't mean that they don't know how to fish. So you have to kind of give them time because maybe they need a little bit more support to show you evidence that they do have understanding of what you're teaching them. Um, and so avoid giving them a zero right away. And that moves into also the, it pairs very nicely with the minimum grading. Um, when you have, if you're working in a school system of zero to 100, they, Joe specifically um, suggests that you have a minimum grading threshold for your, it depends on your system. His book talks a lot about um, that 60 to 100 is passing, but I know a lot of schools in Maine use a 70 to 100. So um, he suggests putting your minimum grading at 50 if your F starts at a 59 and 60 is passing. Um, but if your grading system is something like 70 to 100, then you know maybe um, you give a 60 instead. Um, and again, that's avoiding giving them a zero. Um, again, so that they have that minimum grading threshold of a 60 to a 70 is failing or a 50 to 60 is failing, depending on where your, your that line is for failing. Um, when you are, pa when a student is passing, they have somewhere between an eight point to a 10 point gap between letter grades. So a 90 to 100 is an A or an 80 to a 90 or an 80 to 89 is a B. So there's like an equal amount of distance between letter grades and it's easy for students, not necessarily easy, but it's easier for students to look and say, okay, I have an 85, I'm only five points away from getting an A. But if they get a zero and that's in that zero to 100 point range, um, that's really hard for them to get from zero to 69 or zero to 59 to get that 60 or 70 to be passing. You can keep advancing the slides now. I'm There we go, that's about where I'm at. 
<laughs> right? So what I was saying was we have, when you have an incomplete grading scale, you're, what are you telling your students? If you look at this image here, you have zero to 59, perhaps if you work on this traditional grading scale, or sometimes even more if your school doesn't um, show passing until they've reached a 70. Um, you're offering 60 plus ways to fail and only 40 or fewer ways to get an A through a D grade. Um, so if you can shrink that um, to be more equitable with students, everyone needs a boost. Um, and by making that grading scale closer to here, we have 10 points between the grades. Um, and if you gave them a 50, then they would have only 10 points they would need to improve to get to passing instead of if you give them a zero or even a 30 or a 40, you're still, you know, it's not very equitable for them to have to climb so far to get up to passing. The next, um, bullet point that we talked about was waiting more recent work. So you can go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, zero to four grading scale is our next bullet point. Um, again, Joe Feldman really recommends that schools and teachers use a zero to four grading scale. And I realize that we all realize that if that's not what your school's going to be doing, how could you use this in the classroom if you are a zero to 100 point? Um, grading scale and um, there's ways that you can convert that just on your own in your own classroom um, but we tend to stick with the traditional 0 to 100 scale because we always have but Joe Feldman points out that nearly every test that measures competency outside of secondary schools beyond the classroom they will use something other than a 100 point scale um, we talk about going and get your driver's license you are not necessarily being graded on a zero to 100 point scale, you passed or failed. There's lots of different um, indicators to help you get your driver's test. And if you don't pass, you can take it again. Um, and so try to uh, convert your scores into the zero point because again, like the minimum grading, every point is only one point away. There's like, and then with your, um, you know, can have a 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. You can go like that, but again, you're only going to go so many points before a student can get from a one to a two, two to a three, three to a four. So it's more attainable. And then the last one that we talked about was waiting more recent achievement. And again, some instances where you're going to have more opportunities to perform and to show your understanding and to show your learning. So a person passing the bar exam, they may have to take that test more than once. A marathon runner doesn't run just one race and say, that's it, that's the best I can do. They'll keep running and try more races and always be able to continue to work and improve. Um, and the list goes on. So we ask, why do we insist on averaging our students' scores to get like a final average for them when students continue to learn and improve throughout the year? So that a lot more emphasis should be placed on weighting more recent achievement. Do you want me to go to the next slide? Yeah, go on to the next slide, please. You're doing great, Morgan. So, of course, then there could be the naysayers who say, well, I get that, but if someone knows that their scores closer to the end of a semester, closer to the end of the year, will matter more, will be weighted more, wouldn't they like play the system and not do as well in the beginning so they can show you improvement? No. Students who do badly early in the year will have other reasons for why they um, didn't understand the information and the material at the beginning of the year, why they struggled with that, they're not necessarily working the system. Next slide has another question that some naysayers may ask. Mm, we missed it, sorry, that's okay. The other question was, um, uh, hold on. Oh, about, um, what, what anyway, we'll move on, that's okay. Um, but that, Students should be a part of the end of the year final grading um, because they can give their own feedback about what they've learned and how they've grown as a student as well over the course of the year. So set clear expectations at the beginning of the year 
And then again, students should be able to articulate what they've learned. It can reflect on their growth and their own grade as well and give some input into what they think they should earn as well based on their work. So our takeaways, these are what things um, we are going to um, work on specifically. Um, so each of us, again, we had sort of already, as I said in the beginning, we had all sort of fallen into our own bullet point that we really wanted to work on and make a goal for ourselves. And that helped us to determine who was going to do research for each of these bullet points. So I specifically said that I am going to avoid giving zeros. That should be a zero, not an O, but that's okay. Um, it, it changed in a different format here. Um, and to give more formative feedback, um, to students. Katie is going to set a minimum grading scale and Ellen is going to work um, to try to convert her personal grading scale to the zero to four point scale in her classroom and Amanda is going to work on weighting the most recent work and allow students to reflect more and give input in their final grades. Really showing growth that's great thank you. Um, so um, just a, a quick note, um, as we move forward to our next group, which is what we're doing, right? Um, pay attention to what's already been said and maybe some can not be repeated if it doesn't need to. So, um, and I know it's hard, some groups actually connected and talked about what they would share and some weren't able to do that. So, um, so next up we have Kim Barnes' group. Yep, so I had a, a slides here that obviously didn't necessarily translate real well. Um, well there we go. But we'll, we'll jump in if you want to, um, huh. Um, or you could just let them share their slide, share their screen. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Cause, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll share my screen, Morgan. Is that? Is this Kim? Kim, I'll make you a co-host. Okay. So that you can do that. Okay, there you go. Okay. So while she's getting that screen up, um, Bree, if you want to send your slideshow out to the whole group, it would be fun to see it and how you designed it. Um, and maybe people m might want to use some things you had in there as they start to talk with people at their school as well. So, okay, Kim, you're ready? I am ready. So um, this is grading for, oh, can I move it? Yep, grading for accuracy and this, is our group. We were looking. I don't see anything. You don't a, see mine is a white screen. Oh, good. It's is that, is that other people like that? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Let me, a different screen. Let me try it again. <clears throat> Sorry. No, thanks for letting me know. There is a little pencil moving on a white screen. Hmm. Kim, maybe it'll help if you share like your desktop and then select the present from there. Okay. And this is how we learn. We learn from failure. It's what we're seeing is called the whiteboard, I believe. This looks like the whiteboard. Okay. Sorry, guys. It's okay. None of us are experts at this online meeting stuff. Ooh, it worked, it worked. Thank you. Go. Present. Okay. I'm going to put presentation mode, and if it freaks out again, just let me know and I'll go back. We're good. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. This was um, our group, and Shannon and I actually are teammates. We teach in Caribou together, and Jason is from Gorham. Uh, Michelle is, teaches in Lewiston, and Larry teaches in Saco. So we looked at the pillar of accuracy with a middle school lens. And I'm not going to. Uh, repeat, just really echo the things that Bree said because she did a great job explaining the practices within Pillar 1. So uh, I think we'll just share. We had talked yesterday just about sharing our personal commitments. So 
pillar one people from middle school are just gonna, gonna pop on and talk about their um, personal commitment. What are they going to work on this year? Hi, so I'm Michelle DeBlois and um, my personal commitment is to avoid zeros, to help students um, actually complete assignments rather than just say, eh, I'll take a zero. Um, so I'm gonna strive to make remediation plans immediately to hold students accountable for work completion. One of the ways to do that is that um, there will be a list of graded assignments per standard and they have to show three pieces of evidence to um, that are a three or above to meet that standard. So if they choose not to do one assignment, um, they have to realize that by the end, they have to have three um, that are all a three or above to, to meet that requirement. And I think Shannon was next. Hi, Shannon Sleeper from Caribou, and I want to echo Michelle. I, I also am working really hard at remediation and avoiding the zeros, but I'm also intrigued by this single point rubric. So I've been working on cultivating and creating um, single point rubrics from my previous rubrics that I've been using. I think that'll really start a great conversation piece, and I love the columns for the feedback and for the student feedback as well. And I think that'll open up a conversation about their work that will be transformative for them to reach standards and to actually understand what they're learning, that metacognition is so important. So this Jason? was mine, and uh, thanks, Kim. I, I, I guess for me, like what was, I really try for the uh, non-punitive grading anyways, um, always allowing redos, and I think that um, that's something that that I, I would like to see us do more of, at least in my building, but I know it's hard. I think people, like there's always this catch, and this is where, at least for, for I find, is like like people think that, you know, kids that don't do the work should be penalized, and to some degree, I agree with that, but at the same time, um, I think that we should move to, towards non-punitive grading, because I think that not all the kids have the supports that other kids do, and it shouldn't be seen as, personally, I don't think that grade should be seen as a competition, but I, you know, I, I don't have a, you know, I don't I also, also don't have a child who is, you know, competing for the top 10 either, so I, I can understand that view as well, but I think that that's what I'm looking, looking to do is to kind of keep what we did uh, as a state at, during the lockdown, where we had that, that no harm, do no harm policy, that's what I, I mean, I, I intend to do that in my classroom, definitely. But if I could somehow get that to spread a little bit more, I think that that would be a goal that I would have. Um, this is my personal commitment. This is Kim speaking. And um, I have selected minimum grading on rubrics with the single point rubric as a focus. And I also serve as a teacher leader. So I would really like to help push this idea out to other middle school English teachers um, by perhaps bringing back the idea of common grading of papers with colleagues, finding that, uh, that common assessment so that we can really talk about, you know, what is that success criteria and what does it look like and then articulate it to students. Because I really believe that minimum grading will help create this climate of compassion and hope um, and it will support the development of a growth mindset in my classroom. And I think especially where we've been and perhaps the trauma that kids are gonna bring back into school, that it's really important that I have that um, idea in the back of my mind is how can I also support you know, their uh, social emotional needs? And I think minimum grading does that. And Larry? <clears throat> Uh, I, I was the one that spoke about group projects. Uh, in my school, more than half the teachers still give common grades for three or four students on a project. And not only am I uh, giving individual uh, grade accountability, I, I've actually started to rework my group rubrics this summer to more accurately reflect 
what they have to do and what they have to learn as part of the project uh, in terms of how they're going to be graded. Uh, I, as a gifted teacher, the zero to four, I, I, I have kids who I'm looking that can four and meet standards and I want them to exceed those standards. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna stop my share now, Patty, okay? Great, thank you. It was so nice to hear from all the people in your group. Okay, so Morgan, you're gonna reset your slideshow, yes? Yes. So hopefully... Um, We're gonna to move to pillar two. Wait a minute, we or have, we have one, more one more... We have one more poll to launch. Okay, let's do it. Um, and so this idea is, um, whoop, let me move to, to the launching poll. So, um, you know, the, the question is still about accuracy. And, uh, you know, how, how accurate do you think your grading practices will be in the coming year? I guess part of the question is, do you feel that your, your practices will be more accurate, certainly, than in the past year? Almost there, as answers are coming in. A couple more people to respond. share the results here. So it's, it's uh, definitely ticked up from the previous one. And when this is over, one of the things that I can do is download the two polls and show you um, the, the before and after. Um, Great. Okay, so I'm gonna close Very cool. There, so now we're gonna talk, we're gonna move to bias and pillar two. There was one group, there was just one group of folks who were looking at bias. And so, um, whoops, we'll ask for uh, that group to give us a summary and uh, a brief description of the practices. And then for that one, we're gonna have a whole group discussion. So if you can see, Stephanie Hendricks has put in the chat an infographic that they made in a one pager about it. But who's speaking for the group right now? Um. Actually, can you make me co-host so I can share screen? And then um, I think Melanie's gonna start us off. Great, start us off. Morgan, you making her co-host? Yes. Yes. Okay. You're on. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Up? Oh, here we go. <laughs> yes. Get rid of this. All right. So we with our pillar two bias resistant grading. And so thanks to Stephanie, we made this awesome infographic. <laughs> I've learned something new on this whole thing. So this is pretty basic. Um, so taking this right from the book, our practices that not uh, that value the knowledge and not the environment or the behavior. So taking this out, we would like to ask the question, am I valuing uh, knowledge or am I encouraging an accumulation of points? So this is um, grades that are based on um, required content, not extra credit, because sometimes we know that extra credit can um, be used in a very odd way at times. <laughs> we had some really great discussions during our um, uh, making of this infographic. So what we uh, pulled from the text is that extra credit is rendering a grade that's inaccurate by reflecting information that's unrelated to content knowledge. It teaches students to value points instead of content and creates inequity by offering opportunities to students who have resources already. 
And <clears throat> moving on to the next piece, um, ba uh, grades that are based on student work, not the timing. So we come up with a question, am I grading knowledge or compliance? Um, and so many of my colleagues in my school, this is something that they do a lot. They take points off when um, work is turned in uh, late. And there's so many different reasons why that can happen. But meeting those deadlines isn't academic content, okay? So using, uh, you know, the student's timeliness can be graded, that learning should be very flexible, uh, should be on pace, but it's better produce, what we felt was it was better to produce a high quality piece of work after the deadline than cutting the work short, just as good practice. And then moving on to our next one, cheating. Alternative non-grade consequences. So we talked about that, are asking yourself, are there other options that value learning more than assigning that zero? So when you're penalizing these students with a zero for cheating, um, it is inequitable. Uh, it certainly pulls the grade down mathematically, but it disqualifies these students from learning. Absolutely, that shuts them right down. Um, we're hoping that teachers would choose a more rehabilitative uh, practice than retributive uh, to allow them to learn the content and accountability, not get stuck in that cheating zone and excluding participation and effort. Am I rewarding and punishing students based on subjective criteria? So grades are, should reflect our um, content knowledge without <clears throat> rendering some judgment on their behavior. Uh, students should be taught how to participate and effort um, and a means for learning, not ends in themselves. And I think that this is a very tough pillar in a way that um, this is how go back, yeah. many of my colleagues, and maybe you can say the same, um, they do these things <laughs> still, and no matter what system we have, but keep an eye on the time here. I have to run to Moose here in a little bit, but uh, certainly uh, jump in. <laughs> okay. Do we want to pass things off to Lauren to start on the one pager? Sure. Great. Are you going to put up the one pager? Is that? Um, yep. Hold on. Cool. And you can get the free version of Canva as an educator if you send them like a screenshot of your teaching credentials which is really cool. Okay, so what we did here was our one pager. And if you, um, Patty and Morgan, if you remember my question about can it be a double-sided one pager? Well, we compromised, we just made an additional <laughs> pager. You know, if it accidentally gets photocopied on the other side of the, you know, <laughs> of our infographic, you know, we won't say anything. So we talked about our individual commitments, and um, so Melanie is going to, for reasons she just talked about, not deduct for late work. We had some really good conversations about the real world consequences of late work, which is usually, okay, you just still have to do it, but later. Um, the So I'm planning on taking out any like grade that's explicitly for effort because really I don't know what F like how can I tell what effort a kid is putting in like it's because I only see what's in front of me I don't know what else is going on in their lives I mean you know if they put the idea about effort and participation as a means rather than an end, if they put in the effort, they will do better, presumably, than if they didn't put in the effort. But if a kid isn't doing well, it's so counterproductive to tell them, well, you're not trying hard enough. 
even if you think that's the reason, that's more likely to shut them down. So then we have um, another no zeros policy, which again goes along with the mathematical accuracy pillar number one. Um, but in addition, if we're talking about grades as a reflection of knowledge, then a zero doesn't really accurately reflect knowledge. There's not no knowledge. That's ridiculous. And Stephanie is no extra credit. Um, because we know that extra credit is used for a lot of dubious purposes. Sometimes it can serve as kind of a fail safe. If a student doesn't end up with the grade that you think they deserve, you can throw in some extra credit. Um, you know, but again, if we're grading a student's knowledge, if it's important, it should be part of the regular grade and what you teach. And if it's not important, you shouldn't need to include it at all as part of a grade. So turning it over to Stephanie. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I shared links to both of those documents in the chat and I think now the plan is to open this up for a whole group conversation. So what I would ask people to do is to throw their questions in the chat or use the raise hand function so we can call on you and make you the spotlight video. And then however our group can help answer questions or problem solve, we are, um, we are ready to make that happen for you. So we just need your questions. I, I wonder if anybody kind of feels nervous for the for the the um, things that you've said you're going to change is anybody like oh, I'd like to but uh. um I I will say that I am a little nervous in my school and my context particularly because we got word that um, at the end of the school year that our department chair had been, quote, digging around in our grade books because of the way the infinite campus is set up. And, um, and when, I, when I think about, you know, controlling what I can control and trying to make sure that I am doing what's best for my students in my classroom, I, I don't feel like I have anything to be ashamed of, but I also know that my ethos differs from the ethos that a lot of my colleagues, not, not the ones that are here with me today, but that a lot of my colleagues um, embrace. And, um, and so I worry about that, but I, I've read the book and I'm an English teacher, so I can quote from the text and show the research. So. I'm hopeful that my ability to do that would um, shut any of that down somewhat, at least, fingers crossed. I haven't had a chance to be nervous about this because I'm too busy being nervous about like, what is my actual job going to be when the year starts? Because, you know, it's, yes, <laughs> because reasons. <laughs> So, so is there anybody who, um, you know, has some questions for um, the, the bias group? So, Tiff, yeah, please. Yeah, Tiff. Tiff raised Can I ask hand. Um, I think we'll go to Tiff and then we'll go next. Tiff. And you have questions in the chat popping up now. Yeah, Tiff, what was your question? I'm just, I, I love this and I'm on board with this. I'm concerned. I, I, there's a part of me that's torn about the idea of, um, and kind of what Crystal brought up in the chat too, you know, so we don't give them zeros. We don't penalize them for cheating with their grade. So a lot of this pillar seems to be really focused on intrinsic motivation. And what do you do when you have kids that don't have that intrinsic motivation you know, we don't live in a perfect world where kids just want to learn and do well all the time. Um, they need that carrot or that stick of some sort. And so how do we balance that? And how do we balance that out against what colleges are looking for and the repercussions that are going to exist for them? They're not just going to be told, that's okay that you didn't turn it in on time. 
you have well, more time to do it. And at what point, realistically, do we as teachers have to, we have to have an end point at some point where we don't accept that work anymore or we'll never have our job done either. So, you know, we have other motivations beyond us that we have to, we have deadlines for when quarters end and when grades have to be posted. So how do we balance all that, I guess? That's a loaded question. And I'm just curious what you guys see from diving deeper into this. Yeah, so I have a couple of answers. One, I'm, I'm working on my sixth degree right now. Um, and I've only ever encountered one professor. I have two BAs, an MA, an MED, a CAS, and I'm working on my PhD. I have only encountered one professor who did not accept late work. So for people who ask the question, like I wonder, I wonder what's going to happen to them when they get to college, my experience has been that Deadlines can be extended. Um, so, so I think that there, that's, that's one thing to maybe think about. I think the other thing to think about is that even in the chapter when, um, when they talk about you know, no, no penalties for late work, they do talk, um, Joe Feldman does talk about natural deadlines. So like at a certain point, like at the end of the unit, unit, like students have all unit and then there are some students who have accommodations for like time and a half, for example. So giving students some additional time to finish up. Um, I also want to um, call attention to um, one of our colleagues, Dan Ryder, who co-wrote a book called Intention, which I think is an amazingly powerful book that shifted some of my thinking about um, assessment and, and how that can work with students. And so I might, um, so I might recommend that one also. So I guess Tiff, the answer to the question is, it's not about not having any deadlines, but it's about you know, not penalizing kids for whom it takes a little bit longer for them to get there, that it's more about the knowledge than it is about whether they're doing it on time, so to speak. And there are ways to reinforce um, that responsibility and those executive functioning skills that are more like natural consequences. Like maybe a more natural consequence is, you know, a kid doesn't get to go to their favorite club and instead has to sit in a study hall getting something done because it's late. That's a more natural consequence than, than altering the grade, which is supposed to reflect knowledge. Can I um, just kind of offer that? Um, there was a teacher that I knew that that had um, high school students um, that were not sending work in, or they were just kind of letting it go, thinking that they were going to make it up and all. And he was trying to explain to them that in the real world, when you have a boss and other people depending on you for that work, so he ended up setting up, um, a, I think it was a three-day workshop where he asked different um, bosses from different lines of work to come in because the kids never really saw the big picture of why deadlines, the purpose of deadlines, the purpose of being able to move on to the next step. And he said he had something like, he pulled kids from the high school. I mean, it wasn't just his class. He spoke with teachers and said, who do you think would benefit from doing this? And they said it was amazing. It was close to something like 70% of the kids, it was like the aha moment for them, that they didn't realize that this boss was gonna lose money if he didn't get his part done, so the next person could get their part done. And they just never thought of it as, as linking and being a puzzle piece to some end project kind of thing. And I'm wondering if, if some of our students just also don't see the big picture. They're not seeing the importance because they haven't experienced it beyond, I got a late, you know, I got a late paper. Well, well that's okay. I'm going to be doing another paper next month. So Laura, yeah. I want to, I want to push back on that just mm -hmm. a little bit about the big picture mm -hmm. because my brother-in-law is the only person in my close circle of friends mm -hmm. who is not a teacher mm -hmm. who actually brings work home. Mm -hmm. He is a lawyer mm -hmm. and the work that he brings home, he still gets paid for in the form of billable hours. And I think for the bias resistant pillar, 
What the issue is, and I don't want to get into the debate of should we or shouldn't we grade homework, but I think the issue is when you talk about in the real world, does your boss give you consequences for not turning things in late? Yes, but does your boss expect you to do work outside of the working conditions outside of the corporation, outside of the office building that is set up to allow you to be productive and to get that work done. And oftentimes the answer to that is no. Yeah. And as a result, I think when we are, when we are scoring our students on their ability to get things done in environments that they often have no control about because they are minors, that that's the part where bias intervenes because certain students have a benefit, whether it's because of you know, socioeconomic status or parental education or some other things and other students are at a disadvantage. And so again, it's about, it's about that equity. Like a boss mm -hmm. can ensure equity for everyone in a workplace in a way that a teacher cannot ensure equity right. among all of the students' home environments where they might be doing their homework. Well, and I, th I think that, oh, I'm sorry. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna jump in here for a moment because um, I, I'm just, I, I see connections. I see this discussion linking motivation and accuracy with bias. And the way we've set up this session is that we're gonna hear from a, a ton of folks. The majority of folks studied pillar three, which is about motivation. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hear just a summary of, of the, the pillar and then, um, what the groups really focused on for those practices and then we're going to break into smaller groups we're going to have some smaller groups where we'll make sure that that each one of the three pillars is represented and i think that's where these discussions can dig deeper with the intention mm -hmm. of connecting across mm -hmm. you know, the accuracy the bias and the motivation how do those work in unison so if you don't mind i'd like to sure. um, interrupt to go to pillar three and um and and in pillar three um uh get to that place and the quicker we get to um the breakout the more time you'll have in a breakout to reflect on how the three pillars interact and i think that's going to be a really important part of this mm -hmm. um so i think that i need to maybe share my screen well thank you yeah, thank you, everybody. I, I could have actually listened to conversations about that for a super long time, but we do have to watch time. <laughs> I want to make sure that, that we're looking at that. So, so we have five groups who, um, who studied uh, Pillar 3. Patty, I forget. Did we have, I have the process? Them. Okay. I have them in front of me. Well, I did. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have a group led by Renee, Mary Lee, um, Todd, but someone else is stepping in for him today. Uh, Kate and Angela. Does anybody want to volunteer to go first? I can go first. Thanks, Renee. I'll go after Renee. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Do you want the screen? I don't need the screen. Awesome. Okay. Um, so Hi, we didn't make a presentation and we have a one pager, but we're not sharing it with you today. So there's that. Um, so the driving principle behind the motivation pillar is that the way that we grade should be should motivate students to achieve academic success, support a growth mindset and give students opportunities for redemption. And I'm sure you'll hear all sorts of things because there are five groups um, about what some of those specific practices are. Our group was a collaboration between Kenny Bunk High School English teachers and Marshwood High School English teachers. Um, and we worked together in part because we know and love each other. And then also because we feel like our schools have very traditional systems and also have very similar mindsets. So our schools 
really follow traditionally that zero to 100 scale, um, although we may claim that we have some hybrid version of proficiency-based education, we really are traditional credit-based systems. And so we um, really looked at this through the lens of within our own departments, within our own schools, how can we kind of disrupt this system and how can we think about ways to shift our practices, not just as individuals, but also as like little pods of teachers that we might also be able to get other people in our schools on board as well. So um, we talked about the chapters, um, practices that support hope and growth mindset, practices that lift the veil, and practices that build soft skills. Some of the things that we talked about were uh, really focused on clar clarity, teacher clarity, and transparency of grading. Um, we spent a lot of time in the um, practices that support hope and practices that lift the veil talking about rubrics and then the practicality of the concept of takes at the high school level um, because our curriculum is really focused on content um, right now. So, you know, not really skills-based units. They're really still driven by content, by the text itself um, in our schools. And so we talked a lot about what would retakes look like at the high school level um, and what would the shift to thinking more critically about skills and standards in our practice, what would that look like? Um, so I'm just going to share kind of what our big picture takeaway was as a group and then a little bit about what each of us kind of committed to as far as change is concerned. Um, so we really felt like our overarching takeaway is that we really want to support students to shift away from that like constant knowing that is power school and infinite campus. Um, we feel like our kids really care so much about the competitive nature of grades. Both of our schools are high achieving. Both of our schools have these super motivated students in them, um, but they're motivated by the number. And so we really want to get students to shift away from knowing their numerical grade to knowing where they are as learners and understanding where they are in a specific skill set at any given time. And so um, we said that we were gonna start doing um, our grade books with standards. We all work in a zero to 100 system and we consistently came to the agreement individually but also collectively that we're all gonna get rid of zeros. Like none of us will use zeros in the grade book in any way, shape or form. We want 50 to be the bottom um, and we talked about whether we would give 50s for kids who did nothing. And we had all sorts of very interesting conversations about that. Um, so we really want the gradebook to be standard centric instead of um, assignment centric. And we had some members of the group that are thinking about on individual assignments, identifying what the standard is, and then focusing the feedback formatively on those standards. So students always know exactly what standard they're working on. They always know exactly where they are and their feedback completely centers on that concept. Um, we didn't all come to the conclusion that we could all use summatives in the grade book only. Um, I think there's still a little bit of like the formative has to fit there somewhere. Um, and we haven't come to a conclusion about what that might look like, but we're going to test it out. And um, we also talked about really focusing on scaffolding for students to be able to um, set goals to reflect on their progress that they've made and to do a little bit more self-regulating as learners to shift that motivation away from the grade and closer to um, the motivation being tied to their desire to learn and their desire to improve. Um, and so those were our kind of big picture takeaways and some of the things that we want to work on um, as we support each other through this unprecedented school year. Great. Thank you, Renee. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Kate, you're on. Okay, thank you. Um, I see a lot of connection between the three pillars and um, I think student motivation is, is the underlying, I think our group sort of figured that this would be an awesome place to put our effort because this is the key to what we're after. Um, to get that intrinsic piece bubbling in the kids. So our first discussion, we spent a lot of time talking about hope 
which was um, something I did not predict that we would talk about in this in this learning, but it ended up being a really important conversation. So I'm thankful for it. And when asked the question to, you know, give a concept of the motivation pillar, it brought me back to our first discussion on hope. Um, and it's for students to feel that hope, um, hope that they'll succeed, hope that they'll be supported as individuals, um, hope that they will understand the material and understand what we're asking them to do. Um, and just with that, that they will gain um, confidence and agency, self-awareness, uh, the soft skills that they need, and they'll be in the driver's seat. So in trying to figure out what practices each one of us wanted to implement to make students feel like they were, they knew what they had to do, um, everything that we asked them to do should be clear and they should have a good understanding of where they are, what they've learned and what they still need to know. Um, we each picked something different. So I, I'll just name what we picked. Um, there were five of us, so there's, there are five different things. Um, student calibration came up, wanting students to be able to look at um, student work, whether it's a model or an anonymous piece of work from somebody within the class, um, and, and be able to talk about that work together and calibrate the work, you know, just assess it together against the rubric so that they can understand what the rubric says, means, and how that correlates to what's on the page. Another was using a standard-based gradebook, um, specifically with considering remote learning at this time, um, being able to communicate with parents and students where students are in learning each standard and having that be really clear. The third was to um, take a closer look of the use of rubrics. So we all already use rubrics, but we talked a lot about improving our use of those rubrics. Um, and this teacher wanted to be able to become a little bit more effective in um, giving feedback with the rubric, streamlining that feedback so that it becomes actionable to students individually and it becomes a tool for everyone in the class to learn more effectively. Um, the fourth is just being more transparent, accurate, and fair. And the first step moving toward that would be to use the 60 point minimum and get rid of the zero minimum. And the last was to emphasize process over product, creating a cycle of learning where there's a pre-assessment, student calibration, goal setting, um, student trackers, and then through that, you know, not looking to improve a grade, but looking to improve um, your overall learning habits so that the process of learning improves and therefore your understanding of the material improves. And I think each one of these is tied back to putting students in the driver's seat, helping them become more um, aware of the fact that what they do and what they think and what they understand is is truly at the center of why we're here um, and helping them to take that ownership. And that's it. Thank you so much. And we I have, can have is somebody stepping up? I'll step up. Great. Yes, um, Kate pretty much summarized, I would say, um, pretty much what our group came up with as well. We already have standards. We feel like standards are um, a better way for transparency for students and teachers and parents. So um, our focus, I mean, I could repeat Kate, but our focus, all three of us decided our focus would be on the rubrics and um, working with teachers to, well, two of, two of the people actually are support staff to two teachers, so helping teachers to create a rubric that actually does match what we want to grade. So that was one key thing. Um, and then the other big thing that I'm going to add just to Kate was on the standard-based gradebook. We all agreed that that was a key thing, but I personally thought what was in um, Joe Feldman's book was kind of um, 
convoluted, but I, so I did find a, um, Rick Warmly has a great video for seven minutes if you want to watch it on the grade book. And it only, it puts each student on a page and only grades two things instead of having a whole mess of things on a page. So that's one of the things I'm going to do is develop um, that for each student. And then our other big thing we came up with was redos and how to incorporate those in a better way. Um, and mostly uh, we came back to that thing of having the student be more reflective. So we created a reflection sheet for the student to decide what needed to be redone, why it needed to be done, what were they thinking when they wrote the answer they gave, um, and make the student, give the student the opportunity to be more reflective on their own, what they know and don't know before we start deciding to retake and redo. And we also talked about um, when you're doing an assessment, um, having leaving space at the bottom of it to ask the student, what else would you like to let me know? What else do you know that I maybe didn't ask you? And, and right. have, give them the opportunity to show you that they may not have known the answer to that question or this, but they knew another section very well and was able to expand on it. So we thought that was important too. Just adding to the evidence of knowledge. Thank you. And Marilee, if you get a chance to find the video you mentioned and throw the link into yeah. the chat, that would be cool for people if they want to check it out. And uh, we have two more groups, um, Angela and somebody from Todd's group, Stephanie or Ruth. Sure, I'm ready, Patty. Uh, this ready. is Angela. Thanks. I'm just going to pull up our, our one pager if I could have um, access to share. Yes, Morgan, can you make Angela a co-host so she could share? And I will be very brief as, um, as has been said, we're recapping much of what has been said, echoing um, really earlier p pillars. And I think chapters 11, 12, and 13 pull it all together. So um, I, I think that we're all getting the idea. So I will be just very brief, but I want to show you our takeaway. So um, our group was made up of people with varying degrees of experience, which I think was a really great strength. And um, we focused on much of what the other groups have said as far as really to move to being more equitable. Um, I really uh, appreciated the quote from Feldman. It becomes our moral imperative to stop using grades as punishment and instead to reframe or reemploy them to give more students a sense of self-efficacy, endless capacity, and hope. I think that is the nugget that we all sort of cling to. Our individual commitments were overlapping, focused on minimum grading, frequent use of peer editing, spiraling summative so that we are assessing skills throughout several units across content, standards-based gradebook, no grade penalties for late work, and requiring retakes and redos for all students. Um, all of those practices um, move toward um, opportunities to provide students with um, motivation and hope so that they are not at any given point um, going to be futile and give up because there's no chance of them being successful. Um, without rehashing all of the details, those are the, um, the commitments that we have and the focus and some of the reasons about why. So that's all for ours. Thank you. And one more, do we have someone to present from Todd, Stephanie, and Ruth's group? We may not. Todd is not here because he's in a week long workshop. Ruth was here, but she was having internet connections. Are you still here, Ruth? Ruth is, is in and out, so it may be that other group um, uh, isn't isn't prepared for. Um, uh, I think the third member isn't in in here. So, so so maybe now.
now we move to those small group discussions. What do you think, Patty? Sure, let's do it. Okay, so, huh? so we've tried to split it up so that each room is represented by people who specifically studied, um, you know, the different pillars. Um, and how much time, let me see, what, what, what do we want to give people? How about 15 minutes? Um, what's our topic? Well, we're looking at how the three pillars work together, right? Yes. I don't remember. Oh, wait, here, I found it. I see it's Ruth. So and it, it looks like Ruth is trying to get uh, unmuted. So I think Ruth maybe wants to talk. Okay. Ruth, are you there? I see her. Maybe, I don't know. But I, I, Ruth has been okay. really struggling this whole time. She doesn't have a got bad internet connection. So what we're going to ask you to do in your discussion groups um, is consider how the practices work together. Um, also, just thinking about engagement. And here's a couple of questions if you want to focus on that. Uh, you could focus on how traditional, how grading practices motivated students to be lifelong learners. How do they motivate them? Um, or how you might change, decide to change to motivate learners. And as um, I think each group mentioned, I mean, the accuracy as well as the bias, they're all connected to motivation. Like how, how are grading practices motivating kids and what's important here? So um, you said we're gonna give people 15 minutes and how big of groups are you doing? That's a long time. Um, hold on, let me see. If it, yeah. There. See if I got that. All right. All right. So um, uh, there's going to be somewhere around ten people per group in the three groups to make sure that the three. That's how the three uh, pillars shook out. Um, so how about uh, 10 minutes? How's that? Okay. All right, 10 minutes. Oh, you're doing 10 in a group? It might need 15 if you're doing that many of a group. Okay. okay, here we go. Remember, you have to uh, accept your room assignment. the recording okay great so um hope that that was a good discussion um and we're just going to ask we'll just we're just going to give ourselves up to 10 minutes before we close in the last five for anybody who does have a thought they want to share whether it came from the breakout group or just from your experience as a whole looking at grading and being equitable actually so, Patty, could you just talk about exactly how it's going to go down next week? Like, what should we expect and how is that, that all going to That is, we are going to talk about that. Would it make you feel better if we do that first? It would? Okay. Morgan, okay. can you do that first? So, so one little caveat I have to tell you that whenever you, um, you have an appointment with the commissioner, it's always subject to um, her getting dragged away for something critical at that moment. It's usually, anyway, so we've got her at nine o'clock next Wednesday morning, um, and she absolutely has a standing meeting with the governor at 10, so it's a hard stop. It's a, it's a brief discussion. But what we're looking for is, this is an opportunity to let her know that this group of educators has been digging deeply into this topic and is willing to make some, some commitments and looking for support, support to do so. So why is this topic about grading for equity important to Maine educators, students, and families? Um, we're looking at how we want to make her understand how this particular text-based study is helping to change practice and, and how it's providing hope 
and we want to think about what may be needed to impact pack, um, practice practice through policy. So I think where she has two different teams, the commissioner has an innovation team and she has um, an equity team. I think the two teams can, can come together and I've asked the commissioner um, to make a determination about who should be invited to be a part of this conversation because uh, um, I think that should be her call, like who she wants to be engaging in this conversation. Um, so I don't have any more details than that at this particular moment, but here are some things I want you to know. Um, so, you know, I sent an email and asked you to upload a brief video. We're going to make a montage and thank you to Stephanie, um, who's going to put this together. And so we're going to share that with the commissioner as a way of helping her understand what we've learned. And so just a brief statement and she'll, she'll get to see this montage before, before we come. So if you haven't uploaded your video yet, please do it by the end of day tomorrow. Um, the other thing is I'm asking you to register to participate in this conversation because I want to share with the commissioner the demographic data about who is coming to the conversation. So you'll see I've asked things like how many years of experience do you have? Just looking for um, some of the data that we often uh, share when we're saying this is the group of people who are speaking to you on this topic. So that's why I'm asking for the registration. It's just so that I can gather that data about who's in the room and I can tell her, here are the people who would like to speak to you about this topic. Um, so I put that, that link to the registration in the chat box. Um, I think that, um, I think that's it. I think that's, that's all the details I have so far. And so, as it moves closer and I, and I get more details, anything from the commissioner, I'll let you know. So, and, and at, at the end of this meeting, Morgan, I hope that you will send out an email to all again with the registration link, again with the information from Stephanie about the video upload and the kind of the sentence stem, keeping these short because she's gonna put them together and it, it's she's only got five right now. But if more and more of us do it, um, it could get kind of long. So we don't, we wanna keep our sentences short. Um, so, and that's just about your personal commitment. Like what's one thing you're gonna be changing this year and, and committed to and why? So, um, and also each of the groups made up one pager. You saw some examples of those earlier and Morgan's gonna share those with the commissioner ahead of time. So she'll be familiar with what we've been doing. And Morgan did tell me previously that the commissioner likes to ask questions and hear from you. So when we're thinking about what it's gonna look like, it's gonna look like that. There's gonna be questions and she's gonna actually be wanting people in the group to speak. So it will be more of that whole group discussion where we'll probably ask people to raise hands and we'll pick, pick people and call on them. Uh, so, and are we presenting the slides again to Commissioner Macon? Um, no, we, we're not. I think that she's just gonna get the, um, the one pagers, the one pagers. So that's the plan at this point. And if we hear anything differently, we'll send out an email that lets you know. Okay. We'll keep our so, fingers crossed that there's no disruptions next Wednesday morning that she can join us. Well, that's a good idea. And for those people who need time for their credentials, uh, Laura asked if you could send out certificates to cover all that time that they participated in July. Um, maybe you could just leave the time blank and people could put that in. I don't know if you're okay with that, Morgan, but some, be, some groups spent more time than others. And some people spent a lot of individual time yeah. reading. So if you would be willing to do that and people could say, yeah, I spent eight hours on this or I spent two hours on this, they could fill that in. I don't know if you trust that. us. We, we, I have think policy, yeah. we have policies about contact hours at, yeah. um, at, at DOE. So I, I've got to think about that and explore it. So I'll follow up with you. Okay. Definitely. So um, maybe anybody who has a suggested time that Morgan could put on July, throw that in the chat room right now. Like, what do you think we should get for the time you spent in July? Throw some numbers in there. So if she does have to give us an actual number, maybe she'll hear what you're saying. Um, and does anybody, you know, as we close out, so we have about eight minutes now, but does anybody want to um, just share kind of a closing thought, uh, reflection? Um, anything at all. 
can practice my wait time. This is Angela, Patty. I'm just going to say um, some of the strand of conversation over the months here has been about, you know, how we, how we enact the revolution, sort of like big scale. How do we get everyone to get on board? How do we get everyone to change minds? How do we get administration to buy in, et cetera? And I, I think Morgan and Patty, you both set us up at the beginning that we are grassroots. We are in control of what we do in our classroom and we can choose the practices and set an example and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. And I think there's great hope and empowerment for us in doing that that we can do, as Stephanie said earlier, what is absolutely best for our own students in our classroom. And hopefully we have um, buy-in from people and it does take time to shift these sorts of ideas. ideas. And um, I'm excited for people whose administrators are already in. I know that one person's principal has already had everyone order the book and they're gonna read as a school and different people have like their entire English department. Um, but I'm more like um, Kim who shared that at her school, other people are not interested in reading this book and other people are not interested in changing their ways. I'm just gonna add the yet, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yes. And you know, we have to think about our sphere of influence. Like those are the people that we wanna to talk to. Like who are the people that you're comfortable with at your school to have these conversations? And I've had grading conversations with people in my own department and I'm the department head who don't agree with me. And but I've started small and started to open up those conversations and they didn't agree in the moment, but they, they let it sink in. And so for those people, maybe change later when administration gets involved, it, it's so much easier to change a larger group, but for us individually start with yourself, work with your sphere of influence, whether they're in your department or another department, we're all grading kids, um, share that book as a tool or an excerpt from the book. That's what my principal did. He just copied the first chapter, yeah. shared that with people. So don't give up, but find your comfort zone of who you're willing, who you're ready to reach out to. Um, for so, me, I realized I had to step up this spring um, and step out of my comfort zone to do this with Morgan, for, with you guys, but also even at my own school. And that was pretty hard. It was actually harder at my own school than with all of you. So relearning also has that time frame where it's formative, informative, informative, even for teachers. So. Oh, that's such a good point. Yes. And we try things and we don't like how they work. And so we change it and we try again. And, and that's what I found as I started to shift some of my grading practices last year is I could try something and I'm like, oh gosh, that didn't feel comfortable to me in my web of belief. Um, and then I came back to it. So it is, it is all formative and we're always learning and trying to adjust for what's best for our kids. Well, and I was saying that I really appreciate having this book to be able to discuss the research. I hadn't had anything to really go back to when I'm coaching with teachers. I really am anxious to be able to turn to this page and say, you know, under my new learning and what there, what's been said, um, I think will um, be very helpful. Yeah, so I like this idea of framing this as the revolution has begun, right? Here it is, scrap roots, we're, we're, we're into it. These videos are going to be really, really helpful. Let me um, suggest maybe, and Stephanie back me up on this, a really easy way to do it. Most of us have phones and we know how to do videos with our phones. So you do your little selfie, the this, this statement that you're making, um, really short. And then for me, when I'm sharing videos, I've got this link on my computer. So what I do is I send it to myself in my email account. And then for my email account, I download it and then upload it to the, to this shared Google folder. It's a few steps, but they're actually pretty slick and simple. And, and it, and, and for me, that's my easiest way of getting a little video and getting it, getting it shared. Um, Anybody want to reflect on that technical? Because we, we, need, we do need more. I'd, I'd like to see um, at least 10 different voices in there. Um, and I, yeah, yeah, at least 10 different. And I, and I may upload, just one so you know, Stephanie, I may put something in there just kind of intriguing, like the revolution has begun. And just a reminder, at the very beginning of the book in the, in the, um, 
introduction, these charts that showed the differences between three, three different teachers at the same school. Uh, for me, I'm not a data person, but for some people like our science teachers and our math people, like that actually really says something to them. And even for me, I'm not into it, but that data did show something to me. I'd actually love to do that with my own teachers at some point when they're ready. I wanted to do it last year, but the vice principal didn't let me. <laughs> Other thoughts? Comments? I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you to both Morgan and Patty. Um, I don't know what all of you guys were feeling in June and I can probably guess, but I was feeling like this summer was going to be like a really big disappointment. <laughs> and I think the fact that, you know, we're all kind of stuck at home in various ways and whatever, that this book group has provided me with a way to connect with colleagues across the state, many of which I've never met before. Yeah. Um, and to have these really amazing professional conversations and the fact that we've remained engaged for all of June and July and that I've been having conversations with some of my own colleagues and some of my close friends about things that we never would have discussed otherwise. Um, and I really just wanted to give you guys a shout out and give you a little bit of gratitude because I know that this hasn't been easy. I know that navigating these waters with a bunch of people um, had to have been challenging as well. So I just wanted to, to take a moment to say thank you guys so much for you know, Patty and Morgan for organizing it, for making this a reality, but also for the rest of the group as well, for engaging in such a great professional dialogue. Um, it's been a highlight of my summer. Um, and I hope that we can, you know, continue these conversations, not just with this book, but maybe with some other work in the future. Um, I think we'd all really value that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's very Thank encouraging. You. Yes. And I, Morgan, and I it's Renee's fault that I'm here, just so you know. Morgan, I had to step away for just a second. So if I'm redundant, I'm coming in on the end of Renee, uh, her comment, but I just wanted to say for many of us, um, teaching feels like we're in silos sometimes. And I'm always the uh, eternal optimist, right? I'm not the, the pessimist. And um, I always look for the silver lining and COVID was the dark black cloud. But out of that dark black cloud, thanks to you and your foresight and your vision, all of these learning opportunities happened for teachers and I've made connections with people out of Aroostook County that I'm going to be able to now email and continue learning with. And so my silo is maybe a little bit skinnier or maybe I have some silos on the farm together with people. And so I greatly, greatly appreciate your efforts and you too, Patty, for helping guide this for us. Um, just thank you, thank you. Listen, I gotta tell you, when, when we're able, we're, we're gonna have a get together and it's gonna be, you know, like an in-person kick in here. Here's everybody, we're gonna see each other and I, I can't wait. I mean, it may be a little while, but I'm very eagerly looking forward to that because I do, I, it, it's just, I've loved watching these relationships um, forge and see, I've always known there's these great people all across the state and I have been just so eager to connect you. And I'm really happy to see you um, uh, coming together and, and forming those bonds. So great things will happen. The revolution has begun. We can make that a very big revolution. We're gonna keep it going. So. And I just wanted to close with two things. One, um, thank you to all of you. I'm inspired by the work that you're doing across the state. Um, it's 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 been awesome to meet each one of you vir virtually. So many people I didn't know as well, like Renee said, and Kim. And so thank you to each one of you because it's been so incredible to watch lifelong learners, educators like yourselves, learn and grow as we explore and question our grading practices. Um, and secondly, just a little tidbit, and I hope uh, Morgan will send this out, but the MCELA, um, has put together a special edition of a newsletter um, that has articles on anti-racism, on grading, and on remote learning. Um, I think there's, I think there's like 15 articles. It's amazing. Educators all over Maine from the MCLA's executive board stepped up and wrote articles. And it's going to come out, we're hoping, in about two weeks. And we'll send it out through our MCLA channels. And I hope that Morgan will send it out to all of you so that you get it. Um, but 
we felt it was really important to do some more sharing in on about a variety of topics. So I have two articles in there. I know Renee has an article in there. I'm not sure who else in this room might, uh, but um, it's so exciting to see English teachers across the state writing and sharing their writing with other people. Um, Cause I think that's part of how we'll become better writers as well is by doing it ourselves. Great. So we'll send that out. Yes, absolutely. Well, again, thank you everybody. It's been a pleasure and I really look forward to seeing you next week. Keeping my fingers crossed. Thank you.